Okay, hello ladies. Awesome to see you all, all here. Um, I'm Laura from Tech Industries of Finland. Welcome. Um, I think we definitely have something really nice and awesome going on here today. Um, I was with some of my colleagues earlier today and, and a, a couple of brave gentlemen from our office were also here. And uh, they were looking at the, oh my God, what, what, what's going on here? What's the, uh, it's really high energy people talking and, and, um, and um, obviously they felt uh, that it's a, a little bit different the situation than normally. And I said, you know, this is uh, the other way around, if you look at it, it's the normal for me is usually that it's full of men, the whole uh, event, and there are only a couple of ladies. So it's actually a very good moment to stop that. This is just the same for you, it's, it's just normal. And uh, obviously what we would like is that we'd have diversity, all kinds of people working together. And that's really how we create the most value, get the mo most benefits out. So really nice to have you all here today. We are today going to be talking about value creation, sustainability, and very much about the future. That's really what we think about. What's, what's our future going to be like? Uh, we know that it's uncertain. It's, it's going to be complex. It's going to be something different than what the world that we live in today is like. But the big question is that can we influence what the future is going to be like? And I definitely think that we can and we should. We, that's the whole idea what we're talking about today is how we can impact the future. And uh, when I was thinking about today's topic, that reminded me um, of a time when I was in high school and many of my friends, they were even back then interested in, in the environment and, and what the future is going to be like and, and thinking about what can we do about it. And, and I remember one discussion about whether we should be using leather shoes or not. And um, I started thinking that, okay, it's important what we do as individuals or citizens, but I, also, I would like to do something with more impact than, and, than just as one individual. And so I thought that, okay, maybe I have to learn <laughs> something useful first in order to make that kind of an impact. That, uh, my own path was such that I then became a, a researcher, did science, learned a lot from that, but I, then I realized that also I didn't feel that this is the way I, how I can make the biggest impact. And I realized there is actually a very big gap between the people who make science, create uh, new information, understanding, and then those people who actually create solutions to the real world. There is a big gap and these people are often not talking and not understanding each other. You, you really need a very diverse set of skills and people working to get together to really create new solutions. I felt that my role in life is perhaps facilitating that discussion and trying to get the people to meet and understand each other. And, and that's basically what I'm doing today working with the scientists, with the tech people, engineers, very much with politicians and people making dec decisions uh, on a larger level, trying to facilitate that discussion. And I think it's really worthwhile that everybody of us will think what our role is and how we can really make a bigger impact. World is changing. If we think about climate, change that has created an enormous discussion and actions worldwide. 
uh, example is Larry Fink. Uh, he is the CEO of BlackRock, uh, world's largest asset manager. So they have about seven trillion US dollars on the, uh, of money that they are investing. And for a couple of years, he has published an open letter to companies where his key message basically has been that you need to have as a company a strategy that describes how you create value in a l in long term. And by value, he means value, not only economic value, but value to humans, to the environment, the society in more general. So basically, otherwise, he don't, they don't see the company as a good investment. This is important because uh, that basically is saying that in order to have a good business, you need to have a, a, a way to create value in a sustainable way. The Finnish industry is currently making their roadmaps for different industry sectors toward, uh, towards carbon neutrality. This means what are the concrete actions to reduce emissions, to uh, to really move forward and, and reduce the, uh, the footprint. And very importantly, how the in industry can also make a positive impact. So what kind of positive solutions uh, the industry cr can create that help to solve the problem. And we are really in a good position to do this because the Finnish industry is actually the world's cleanest and most environmentally friendly industry today. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't do more. Actually, it means the con on the contrary, we should do much more and we can do much more. And by this way, we can actually have a global impact in these areas. Then if we think about how is this going to happen. Circular economy is a, a way of thinking, it's a way of operating where you sort of build in, uh, in the operations, uh, value creation and then reducing inefficiencies. This happens by putting the customer in the center. So you focus on what kind of value you, you really want to create. You're bringing technologies. And it's important that now I think we are really in, in a position that we have technologies that enable us to do things in a very different way that we used to do. And putting these two together helps us to create business models that focus on delivering value and uh, reducing inefficiencies. Um, I, for example, if you take the product as a service business model as an example, you can think about a company that has been selling lighting equipment. So these kinds of lamps, or then you can think about road lighting or lighting in very big industrial buildings or shopping malls. Uh, previously, the company has tried to sell as many pieces of equipment as possible. That's a good business. Try and grow and sell more. But what if the company started selling light? Not equipment, but selling light as a service. So the value, if you think about roads, probably the cities want the roads to be lighted at the right time. They necessarily don't want to own the equipment. So uh, if this, and it's actually happening today, selling light as a service, it would give the company incentives to manufacture equipment that's easy to, ma uh, easy to maintain, perhaps modular design so they can re easily repair if something gets broken, uh, energy efficient, and so on. So it gives the company incentives to do things in a sustainable way, and it makes business sense as well. 
So these are the in the heart of these circular business models that we think about ways in which it makes business sense and it is sustainable, the whole operation. So today we have uh, two speakers, really fantastic ladies sharing their thoughts with us. And uh, on this, and first up we have Soili Mackinen. She is the lady heading the digital transformation at Cargo Tech. So please, Soili, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, seldom the emphasis is on the word lady. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I have to say, not to go any, any level of, of detail on this one, but this is the first ever moment that I speak to audience like this. <laughs> Humbling. Humbling. All right. Um, I was given the, the topic, how to create sustainable value. And I thought, that, wow, fantastic. Uh, I don't need to go do the effort of trying to create a slide set. The slide set is there. We talk at Cargotech a lot about sustainability. And it is in the core of many of our uh, business drivers, and it's in the core of many of our values. We think about sustainability in terms of uh, doing business, so business ethics. How do, we business, how do we do business across the world in different countries and different parts of the world? We consider sustainability in terms of safety. How do we create safe operating environment for our employees, uh, for our employees in, in the network? Uh, but also for our customers and, and in their operations when, when they use our solutions and, and products. And of course, we think about sustainability in terms of climate actions and targets therein. So it's an important driver for us. Um, to put Cargotech in context uh, a little bit for those of you who might not know us that well, we are a global company, stock listed here in Helsinki, uh, family owned uh, to, to a large part of 50%, which gives us uh, maybe a bit more long-term uh, view, sustainable long-term view compared to, to many other technology companies. Our owners are not that uh, impatient in terms of uh, next quarter. Um, we are about 12,000 people, um, so still a small company in the big world, but big enough to see things from different angles and, and having the opportunity uh, to operate in different cultures, in different geographies and in different circumstances. Sustainability is a business driver for us. Uh, we serve an industry that is not famous of being uh, the source of sus sustainable thoughts. Actually, on the contrary, we serve an industry that uh, produces the majority of emissions. And one could argue that, okay, so how can you pr be proud of working in that type of environment? But actually, it does exactly that. We made a study a few years ago together with McKinsey, how efficient this industry is. And we found out that only in container value chain, there's a 17 million euro waste taking place on annual basis. So we waste money and value worth of 17 million euros. But not only that, we also use, uh, uh, create emissions worth of 19 million CO2 equivalent tons only by moving empty containers. So we thought that's a fantastic opportunity. That creates us an opportunity to make a difference in that world under those circumstances. And we looked at it very much from the, through the digitalization lenses and software lenses. What can we do in, in better way how can we improve our customers' operations and the industry operations, remove the waste, and the, uh, by doing that, 
also reduce the emissions and uh, make the world a better place. We think that by setting us our, uh, for us a very aspirational and ambitious goals of becoming the leader in intelligent cargo handling, we actually send the message that we do want to make a difference in this world. We are present, I said our, our business is present in, in, um, uh, in all continents, basically, in, in uh, different parts of the world. Um, our solutions are also present very much in this um, uh, logistics industry. Um, there are 700 million container moves taking place on annual basis. Kalmar, which is one of our business areas, solutions touch every fourth of them. There is a McGregor solution on every second uh, merchant vessel sailing the seas. There is 500,000 uh, cargo cranes running out there using uh, high up loader cranes. So we are in a position to make a difference in, in this area. We can, uh, we know how the industry works, where the inefficiencies are, or at least we do have a chance to know that through our customers and through our uh, network and, and uh, partners. And by doing the right choices, uh, developing the right solutions, we can make the world a better place. And making the world a better place is definitely a good reason in itself, plus the fact that it makes good sense in terms of business. It creates value for us, it creates value for our customers. So it's a win-win uh, formula. The title of this um, slide, Cargotech Central Business Driver, is to reduce logistics carbon footprint, is actually a direct quote from the chairman of the board uh, in last Sunday's Helsingin Sanomat. He uh, thinks about environmental issues a lot, and he also contributes to Cargotex's mission and vision to make a difference. But it's not only that. that that's a very important thing and, and encourages us uh, to work on this agenda. But it's not only about that. It's, it's also that the, the world is changing. The regulatory bodies are paying more and more attention to it. IMO, which is the Interna International Maritime Organization, has set an agenda to reduce uh, uh, carbon um, emissions, CO2 emissions by 50% by 2050. In my opinion, 2050 is too far away, but it's a, nevertheless, there's the target and there's the ambition to go to the right direction. There are other regula regulatory bodies that are uh, putting even uh, more stringent and more up-to-date regulations in place. For example, the Cal California Green Air Act is uh, working towards the direction that the ports and terminals have to go elect electric and they have to reduce uh, also the emissions uh, on the, on the seawater uh, caused by the, the vessels uh, visiting those ports and terminals. So it's uh, really um, market demand and regulatory demand that we have to uh, work on these topics and this agenda. Also, investors are more and more looking at the sustainability um, values of the companies, and not only the values, not only the words on the value promise, but really what do we deliver and how do we measure that? How are we sure that the, our offering and our products are actually eco-efficient and, and they create the impact that we say they create? So it's very much about also fact-based proving that, that uh, we not only talk, but we also walk the talk. And last, but definitely not the least, our customers are also uh, demanding these solutions. They, they want to have solutions that are cleaner and greener. Staying within the 1.5 degrees of global warming um, is a tough challenge. We all, all of us who, I'm sure that when, when you came into this room, you came for a reason. So you are worried about what's happening. Uh, so am I, by the way. 
uh, three kids and two grandkids. I'm really worried about what's happening. But um, uh, it's a tough agenda, nevertheless. And it goes to say that, um, for example, Cargatec in our own operations, we can only impact fraction of that. So if we look at the, our products, wh what do we need in order to make those products and how are they used when, they, uh, when the customers are taking them into their operations and what's happening after they uh, retire from those operations. That's a far bigger role in the, in the whole um, uh, climate footprint. But of course it doesn't mean that it takes us off the hook that we don't need to care because we only are responsible for, for the small part. On the contrary, it, we need to make sure that that small part is as efficient as possible in this respect. But we also need to make sure that we make our best to impact our network, be they our vendors, partners, or be they our customers, so that this topic stays on the agenda and we continue caring about the climate change. Now, one thing, uh, this 1.5 target calls for big actions. I, we can do fine-tuning of things. We can make our factories um, carbon neutral. We can make sure that um, in our offices, we don't waste water or we don't, don't waste electricity or, or whatever is the way that, that we want to underline the agenda on, on small things or bigger things. But in the global scale of things, it calls for quite big moves. And this is one example of the big moves that, that uh, we have on our agenda as well. We won't be able to get this done by ourselves, but the fact is that the sea freight transport is by far the most sustainable transport mode. And the, the, that I say it here in this forum, of course, doesn't uh, move the needle. It, it only moves the needle so that now you go home and you think about this and you next time you come across uh, a choice, you maybe make a choice. But uh, it goes to say that the more and more we make these choices that are big choices, that, that we actually make the sea freight transport um, as efficient as possible and as, I would want to say, cost efficient as possible, the more we get transport into that area and the more it moves away from, from uh, for example, air cargo, which emits uh, much more uh, um, unwanted uh, if effects or has much more unwanted effect. So by building this, these solutions that uh, gear towards efficiency in, the, in those modes of transportation that are climate friendly, we can also move the needle and make a difference. This is the part of the story that is less, as I said, it's less in our power to make this really move, but it's very much in our power to keep the ag agenda high up and make people aware that this is a fact. And that's, that's how then uh, the change gradually will start happening. The industrial, uh, being the leader in an industry is not always easy. You sometimes go to areas where you, or maybe I don't generalize this, maybe I, ca I, I can just give an example in our own experience. We wanted to make um, uh, terminals and um, shippers talk to each other, shipping lines talk to each other in, in a better way so that they can plan their cargo in a better way. And we introduced a solution, a software solution, a platform where they can exchange data. And as it turned out, they didn't want to do that because they felt that they, we take away some sort of competitive edge from them where, when we bring visibility into these operations across the industry. So it's not always self-evident that even the good news or even the good solutions are 
welcomed by open arms in the industry. But it takes a lot of guts to go there and say that we can make a difference uh, and, and uh, we can change this industry. It also takes a lot of persistence, it takes years to convince these type of things. So going, uh, underlying the, the importance of sea freight is, is also difficult from that point of view that it, it's not an easy thing to, to do to change towards that direction. Now, back to Cargatec uh, and, and what we do, what we do do is uh, we do have a product range of eco-efficient products and we are proud to say that we, we are following that on continuous basis, on, on consistent basis and report that also out. And we also have an ambitious target going forward. We want to double the eco-efficient eco product range sales compared to the growth of the, of the traditional product range um, by 2021. So, so it, it means it has to make business uh, sense for us in order to reach this target. And, and therein it also brings us the motivation to make sure that it happens. And when we say this out loud, obviously gives us then the responsibility to also deliver what we have said we would do. Now, a little bit on the solutions that, uh, that we work with and that we, we do have. Um, on the systems efficiency, so um, I didn't talk too much about the products or solutions that we uh, deliver, but these pictures maybe gave a reflection on, on what it is. So on, the, on your left-hand side, there is a cargo terminal, and uh, in those environments, what we can uh, today deliver in terms of eco-efficiency eco and sustainability is the visibility to the inefficient use of the resources in that terminal. And the inefficiency goes to the actual operations themselves, but then also into, for example, fuel consump consumption and how much uh, of that has taken place. And these solutions uh, use very much software. Uh, so, so it's not only about the mechanical products that are important in, in this context. It, it is the software component that brings the visibility and the data and the fact base for, for the discussion. On the second picture, there is a um, crane loading some sort of scrap material. And uh, this is our one of our offering range that goes to um, environmental industries. We work with various types of uh, waste management solutions and also in that space, of obviously the solutions themselves are part of the environmental offering, but then also therein we make sure that we add the software component that can help us and help our customers primarily to operate those equipment uh, in, in a sensible way and in a resource efficient way. Um, on the third picture, there is a um, forklift truck, I believe, and um, that's, um, that goes to underline the fact that we have a product trains that are, are fully eco-efficient in terms of, of uh, uh, being electrical and the component where they use uh, fuel, we can guarantee the fuel consumption. So again, by using data and by using algorithms, we can change the business model of that product range and actually offer um, fuel guarantees, which then we obviously need to make sure that the fuel is consumed only to the extent that we think is, is the necessary amount and not more than that. It helps to be it helps the sustainability agenda and it also helps uh, uh, the predictability of the product range. And then last, last but not least uh, is, is the service agenda. Um, there was a, a mention of, about product as a service concept and that's also very much on I, very high on our agenda. 
but in that also in the traditional services, we can work much towards being more sustainable and me being more uh, eco-efficient. Uh, a, a very pragmatic example of that type of solutions is that uh, when our equipment are connected to cloud and we can analyze the data coming from the equipment, we actually don't need to drive uh, hundreds of kilometers uh, to see the equipment in order to know whether it needs parts or whether it needs maintenance. But we can make that call based, or based on that data we get. So again, it helps for more uh, to create more sustainable business processes for our own operations and, and obviously then help our customers uh, in, in that same context as well. So, I said that the sustainability is uh, worth underlying because the big promise of, of saving the world for the future generations and uh, why not ourselves uh, in, in the process as well. Um, but it does make good business sense as well. Thank you. Thank you, Soilim. Just a moment. Next, we will have a short discussion about this. 88% of young people in Finland think that the purpose of your job is more important than what you get paid for it. So have a moment, one minute discussion in your table groups. What do you think about this? And then we'll have a couple of comments from the audience. <laughs> Let's see what kind of thoughts we have. We'll get two comments. So somebody just raise your hand. Uh, what kind of an ideas did you get that you'd like to share? We have a microphone over there. Somebody must think something. <laughs> Go ahead. Agreed. Everybody agrees. So would you just get a, a, a really meaningful job for no salary? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> not that. You, you need to have a living, but it's, it comes first, the, the, the meaning that and, and the purpose of your job. Yeah, so it's a really big driver. I think this, that that's probably something that we all share, that we need want to be doing something meaningful with our lives. With tech industries, it's a good, good thing that actually you can have both because you, you can have a reasonable salary and do something meaningful. And obviously, I hope that would be possible for all jobs, uh, obviously. But but that's a, that's a good way to go. Next up, we have an entrepreneur, Annu Nieminen. She has founded her own company, and, um, and she's taking up a task that I think is, uh, is tremendously difficult and, and definitely uh, something that the world needs. So let's hear, Anno, what you're doing. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Anno. Uh, as for my background, I'm an engineer from Aalto University, or Otaniemi. Um, and I'm here today to talk about my passion to create better understanding about what companies actually get done and could we create better ways to measure it? It's 2019, and I think uh, we have technology that could actually help us be a bit better than where we are today in terms of measuring impact and achievement and net value creation of companies. But I'm going to start today um, by um, describing a problem um, that has been bugging me actually for quite some time probably started around the time when I was still in high school. And I kept thinking, why is it that even though we humans are 
getting smarter and smarter all the time and getting all these achievements, we are still kind of, in many respects, uh, repeating uh, same processes over and over again, getting exhausted while doing them, and not necessarily all the time understanding what is the value in the real world that is being caused by these processes. And the problem that I'm really passionate about is understanding our way of measuring impact and value creation by companies. And I'm, claiming, I'm starting today by claiming that our way of measuring is outdated and stuck in an economy that actually no longer even exists. Now, what do I mean with that? If we look at metrics that are available today for companies, we can look at some really great uh, model citizens in this discussion that are actually very good performing as metrics. So what is a good metric? I know I'm not the only math nerd in this room today. Um, there are very, very many of us. So at least for me, a good metric is one that people from different contexts understand the same way. Now, if we look at the metrics available for companies, we can look at, for example, I put here a revenue, maybe your profit, your uh, growth rate, maybe the share price. These are all very, very good metrics and very high performing metrics because we can be looking at a startup from Korea or maybe a mid-sized company from Kokkola, Finland, or then um, a tech giant from Silicon Valley. And we all understand these metrics the same way. But they are all about the performance of a company and tell us kind of little about what is actually achieved by the companies and their impact. So what's the consequence of all of this? As a consequence, we as humanity are actually really, really good at incrementally tweaking the way of doing things. Let's say that we know that we are in point A and we know that we want to be going to point B. Uh, I think we as humanity could actually give, give ourselves a, a good applaud for being pretty good at coming up with new ways, maybe cheaper ways, faster ways, prettier ways, more energy efficient ways, more uh, sexy ways uh, to actually go from A to B. But what we're not that good at is understanding, are we really in point A? And is it really point B where we should be going? We're not very good at determining the what we should be doing, but we are kind of good with the how stuff. Now, how does this really demonstrate itself in practice? Uh, before starting this company, so Laura mentioned that I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I started my company two years ago, and before doing that, uh, I wanted to make sure that I'm not stuck in this Nordic bubble and just looking at things from our Nordic, Nordic nice little perspective. I wanted to understand how these things are approached um, uh, also in the, in the bigger sea of things. So I, I did a couple of months of studying in Silicon Valley and tried to, uh, tried to understand how do companies try to differentiate themselves when uh, trying to get the best doers to join their company. As many of you probably know, the competition for the best doers in Silicon Valley is fierce. Everybody wants the, the best of the best from Stanford who have their microbiology degree together with their aesthetics degree and their machine learning degree to join their company above everything else. And there is so much on offer. So the competition is fierce. So I wanted to look at the arguments that the companies are using to attract the people to their companies. And I saw stuff like this. Okay, we attract the best talent. We grow faster than everybody else. Okay, great. Um, we have all these great tools and toys and gadgets that you get if you join us. Our parties are cool, cooler than everybody else's parties. Our um, culture is very agile. This used to be a cool word like uh, 10 years ago, maybe. Our customers love us and our code is just beautiful. Now, this is all really good. Don't get me wrong. It's definitely better to do things well than to do things poorly. That goes without saying. But to do what exactly? Um, OK, so I made quite a big claim in the beginning that um, the metrics, uh, metrics that we have are outdated. And many of you must be going, but hey, there are some impact metrics. Maybe you use them at work. Soily for sure has, uh, like, like we just heard. Um, and, and you know that there's, there's a lot of things going on. And you're right. In the past, um, especially past two decades, and, and increasingly so, humanity has taken huge step forward in terms of like starting to understand also the impact part of companies. And there is one metric among this, among this uh, myriad of metrics that, has, that is definitely the model citizen among them, and that is carbon footprint. There is no way that anyone in this room has avoided hearing this concept as a consumer or professionally or probably both. Um, 
and that's great. These kinds of individual metrics, it is absolutely crucial that we develop this further. However, for decision making like this, whether you are looking at from the perspective of being an employee or from the perspective of being an investor or maybe maybe as a customer choosing where to buy from, they are not they don't yet bring us very um, to the point where we actually should be. So let's take an example. Uh, let's imagine two companies, A and B, these two pink balls here. Let's say that Laura, you now ha have a company A, and Soily, you have company B. And the only piece of information that we have of these two entrepreneurs' companies is that uh, the carbon footprint for company A is X tons, whereas it's two X tons for company B. Now, just purely based on this, this information we have, we could be like, Laura, you win. Soily, shame on you. Very, very bad. <laughs> it's good, it's good. But if we don't know what these two entrepreneurs' companies actually get done, what is the product and service that they do? What is it that they do on the plus side? No company in this world exists to create GHG emissions. That doesn't make any sense. They exist to create some positive value on the other side. If we don't know what Soilis and Laura's companies actually get done, we have no idea in which of these entrepreneurs' hands this resource is actually in better use. That's why we need something more than just individual metrics. And we need to understand both the resources used and the gains that are being created. Okay, luckily there's this thing called corporate social responsibility. Please raise your hand if there is in your company that, or that you're working in right now, uh, there is some kind of function for responsibility or uh, CSR or maybe a personal report or something going on. Perfect, very good. And we know that there's, there's one for Karkadek as well. This is really good and positive um, development. However, there is still a couple of um, um, features in this discussion and in the whole sort of function of corporate social responsibility that could be taken to the next level, given that we are in 2019 and we can demand a bit more from ourselves. The first part of the current impact discourse may be at, at large, not just the CSR function and how they are led, is that we are still quite stuck at minimizing the bad stuff, minimizing the minuses. Let's say that a company um, might make a list of suppliers that have been caught of doing some naughty stuff. Let's say that they've been some really, really nasty child labor things that they have somehow been, been um, caught up in. Um, and we say, we no longer play with these companies. Or let's say that there's, uh, we work quite a lot with uh, investors. So there's an uh, investor that says that we made a list of the top 100 GHG emission causers in Europe and we no longer invest in them or we divest our investments in them. It is every time, it is very good to react to negative stuff that goes without saying. But we are quite far from actually optimizing the full picture if we don't understand what is being gained on the plus hand side. Uh, that's why this kind of, uh, just minimizing the minuses is not good enough. Neither is maximizing the pluses. All of us as mathematically intelligent women in this room understand that you have to understand the net sum to actually make smart decisions. Um, the second um, little handicap in the current impact discourse has to do with understanding scale, which we really don't. Uh, we, are measure we are really confusing big and small things at the moment, quite in a, in a colorful, funny mess. Uh, let's say that um, we've all seen these, these uh, let's ban plastic straws campaigns by the hamburger companies uh, there in, in the streets of Helsinki and elsewhere. And let's say that another example would be a mining company coming out with a big campaign saying, we now start to use recycled office paper, um, which first sounds really good, like recycles better than not recycled. But then when you start to think about it even a little bit more analytically, you understand that hmm, this, the choice of a copying paper is probably not among the top 100 impacts for a mining company, not even necessarily the top 1,000 impacts. Um, so before we've actually looked at the largest and most relevant impacts, is it even responsible to be talking about this, or is it just a way to, to take attention uh, away from the big stuff? Now, don't get me wrong. Again, the person who is in charge of the ecological aspects of office supplies in this company, this is a very smart choice for her or him. But if the management or the board or the owners hide behind stuff like this and don't look at the core business, then it's just a very poor business in 2019. And that no longer flies, as we also heard a little bit maybe from, from Soili's um, uh, presentation before. 
As a consequence, a lot of the big st stuff gets overshadowed, but this is, I would say, as a very positive thing, is changing very rapidly at the moment. These kinds of little campaigns no longer suffice uh, for smart companies, and they are forced, which is, I think is a good thing, to look at the big stuff and be very honest and no bullshit about them. Um, the third part is maybe not necessarily as obvious as the first two ones, and that has to do with the value chain part, where the impact happens. So we can very roughly divide the impacts a company has on the, on the surrounding world to three parts based on the uh, part of the value chain where they happen. So obviously we have internal impacts. Those are usually the ones that are easy to understand. So let's say we run a factory, uh, we cause X tons of GHG emissions, we use Y uh, cubic meters of fresh water, we employ 100 people and we pay uh, X euros of taxes to the government. These are all internal impacts. In addition, there's of course upstream, so the whole value chain, your suppliers and their suppliers and so on, all the way to the very, very primary production uh, points. And then there's the third part, which is downstream. And that means when the product or service is being used by the next company or person in the value chain. So in B2C, it's consumers, and in B2B, it's other companies. And the absolute scale of impact is always, when a company creates any kind of value and functions in any kind of rational way, the absolute scale of impacts in downstream are always by far the largest. One of the, impact, one of the industries that I've actually looked more into this is the automobile industry that has um, evaluated that, um, or estimated, sorry, that when the, let's say, the Volvo car leaves the Volvo factory, approximately one to two percent of the GHG emissions have been caused at that point of the, of the process. Obviously, majority come when you drive the car. That's very common sense, but this is sometimes forgotten when we only look at things a company can measure internally inside uh, their own premises. For me, logically, this also leads to the idea that it's not reasonable or it's not very realistic to think that the way we're going to boost this con conversation and take it to the next level would come by each and every company coming up with their own methodology of estimating what, what happens outside of them and what part should be allocated to them. That's one of the reasons why we've started at Upright to really build a top-down mathematical model where we try to understand the global value streams and production streams. As difficult it is, I think somebody needs to start from there and try to get at least somehow the numbers right. Because this simply can't change by, by every company having the burden to come up with these kinds of mathematical models and, and our own ways of, of measuring. Okay, um, that's enough complaining. So uh, what am I really doing about this, this problem? I'm an engineer and I love to try to solve problems, not so much describe them. So what is it that we're doing at Upright? Very, very shortly, uh, this is the simplest possible presentation of what we're trying to produce. We're trying to bring out the shape of a company. On the left-hand side, to describe what kind of resources this company uses, and on the right-hand side, to describe what does this company actually get done. Every single company causes uh, some kind of minuses, so uses some resources or causes some negative uh, impacts. I can't even run a one-woman um, uh, laptop cons uh, co consulting company from my home with just my laptop without causing some GAG emissions. Um, so that goes without saying. And every single company exists not to create those costs, but to create something positive. And that's what we want to measure on, on the plus hand side. Um, uh, we look at both the pluses and the minuses. We don't um, rush into any conclusions like, ooh, there are a lot of GHG emissions, you are in the physical production, so that must be bad, but rather very calmly look at uh, and try to understand the big picture for the company. Um, in a, more, a bit more detailed uh, way, what we really look at when we talk about impact, we try to understand the full value creation of a company. That might sound like a really, really ambitious, crazy, and even a bit like um, insane idea, but this is the, the common sense grid that we are using at the moment. So we look at four dimensions of impact, the environment, um, the health of people, not just the physical health, uh, but also mental health and st stuff like relationships and uh, joy and meaning. Um, we look at the society at large, including also the economy, so stuff like taxes and jobs, which is also a, an important part of how companies impact the world. And we look at knowledge. Um, the knowledge part is one that when we were uh, starting this company and looking into all the global um, uh, frameworks having to do with impact was one that we couldn't find from any other, but we felt that we couldn't intellectually, honestly, build a model around net value creation of companies 
if we didn't take into account uh, the, in, uh, the knowledge that companies are creating and distributing, or the knowledge infrastructure they're building. There is a, maybe a, a fun little detail that the first, uh, first impact in the, in the uh, blue sections, the scarce human capital, is the individual impact that is most uh, loved, hated, and asked about in our model. So maybe I should open it up a little bit. Um, that is the opportunity cost for using the brains, like many of which in this room today, or all of us in this room today. So, so the brains of, of people who would have and other, also other, other uses for their brain. So basically, our model treats uh, natural resources and human capital in the same way, seeing that there would be an alternative uh, scenario for that, uh, an alternative uh, use for that resource as well. So in, in, in practice, it means, uh, to give you a concrete example, that if we look at two companies, one of them employs uh, 200 um, super brainy geniuses straight from all the university that have both the microbiology and the aesthetics and then also a PhD in mathematics uh, degree. And then another company that employs 200 um, long-term unemployed uh, young people from Vanda that have been, uh, been trying to get back into the working life. Uh, the first company would have to get more done on the plus side, on the right-hand side, to end up with the same net score as the second one. So we want to kind of also poke into the, into the conversation of thinking that, hey, startups don't have any minuses because they don't have factories and stuff like that, or that probably many of us working, in, working mainly with our brains, uh, more so than with our hands today, uh, also should bear some responsibility of where we actually use our time. Many of, many of us have been uh, educated by public funds, and all of us have something very crucial to, be, to offer to, to the society and to the problems we are solving. So that's just a, it doesn't mean that companies that employ a lot of highly educated people are automatically negative, quite the, quite the contrary. It just means that you have to get something done for that resource on the, on the plus side. Similarly as, as you have if you use um, natural resources or the environment, environmental resources. Cool. Uh, as I know that there are a lot of really smart, smart women in, in the room today, I also want to give you a very brief description of how the model actually works. Um, this is something that, to give you a proper, proper tour, I would have to uh, use, let's say, a two, three hour session to guide you into the mathematical model, which I would love to do, by the way, if anyone's really interested. And I also encourage you to read more on our website. But very shortly, um, what we have done is built a model that is very much circles around this first uh, left-hand side um, ball here, input number one. So we can see the, the model consisting of three inputs and one output. The first input is that we've built um, a network, or actually mathematically, correctly speaking, a graph of all products and services that are currently trading in global markets that understand the value chain links and relationships between the products, as well as, um, uh, as, well as their relationships to one another, if they're, being, if they're somehow similar, if they're being used to produce one another, and so on and so on. Um, this is our aim to get a sort of top-down understanding of how does actually value and production streams flow across the global markets. And also, we have added dollars there so that we understand the monetary uh, values as well. This, this taxonomy needs to be very, very granular. So one example there could be um, an aspartam sweetened cola drink packaged in a recyclable plastic bottle. That would be one, could be one example of a product in ball number one. Ball number two, so what else do we need for a minimum viable product for a net impact model? We need to understand what are all the ways a company can impact the world around them. Currently, we use this grid of 19 impacts. We look at both the pluses and the minuses and three parts of the value chain, upstream, internal, and downstream. This brings us to a 19 times 2 times 3, so one 114 point matrix that we start to fill in for each and every one of the products in ball number one. And then we move to the circle number three, which is then our data source. We're currently using the world's largest open access database for scientific articles. It's called CORE. I don't know if, if many of you know it from your work, uh, but it's really cool. I recommend you check it out. Uh, they allow anyone to use it through an API and make any kind of magic happen. So what we then do, we take one product from ball number one. Let's take the cola drink, the bottle. Uh, we take one input, uh, sorry, one impact from input number two. Let's say we take GHG emissions on the negative side in downstream. And then we ask uh, ball number three, what do you know of the impact of this bottle to the GHG emissions in downstream negative side? 
This comes to the core of our IP. So what we've been uh, successful at doing is that we've been able to teach a machine to understand causal relations between two words or two terms that consist of more than one word um, in natural language. So what it means essentially is that we are able to read scientific articles and summarize findings in them uh, with the machine. Otherwise, this whole process would take more than 2,000 years, even if we hired, hired uh, I did uh, this funny calculation with like uh, 5,000 students or uh, really hardworking Chinese people that we could hire. Yeah, so this enables us to read those, those uh, scientific uh, articles automatically and summarize the findings in them. So we do this as many times as there are combinations between products and impacts, and what comes out is an automated net impact profile for all the products and services currently traded in global markets. When we add these up, we get companies weighing with their revenue contributions. And when we add the companies up, we get funds or industry groups, maybe client portfolios, uh, countries, uh, whatever we, we may want to be looking, industries. Cool. Uh, this is just one example. I recommend that if you want to um, have a look, there's also on a website a, a bunch of, we try to be as open access as possible without totally uh, killing our business in the process. So we give away at least like something like 1,000 uh, company profiles for free if you want to go and have, have a look. But this is what comes out of it. Um, this is the kind of picture of the of one uh, net impact profile. This is now the aggregate profile for US Fortune 500 that we sometimes use as a reference group for, for example, funds or industry groups. Cool, I'm gonna leave you today uh, with the thought that the rules of business are changing. We used to think of impact as something that, uh, if this was where my business was going, this was my profit, then impact is something that kind of points in the other direction. So let's say that I'm running a successful business and when I've been successful enough, I may be buying the dolphin electricity or kind of like something that is nice to squirrels or something like that. It's a bit more expensive, but I'm just such a good person and such a good manager that I'm gonna do it anyways. It's an extra OPEX category for me, but hey, I'm just, I'm just so great that I'm gonna do this anyways. So first I make some money, then I use some of it for doing something good. This kind of approach is not gonna fly for companies that want to be relevant and actually competing in, in the global markets in a couple of years. The new business paradigm is that the companies who actually will be the winners in global competition are ones that have actually found a way to align their common sense net positive impact together with their business targets. This doesn't mean just about hucking dolphins or making bags out of hemp or something like that. This can mean something very common sense. An example that I like to use are uh, sewage systems. Yes, they have a lot of, uh, we need to use some metals and fresh water and energy and whatnot. There's a lot of physical production having to do with them. But think about the impact of us having sewers in let's say Helsinki. As a consequence of that, our two-year-old kids don't die of diarrhea as many do still today in, in other parts of the world. So that's a very good common sense example of a net positive business model um, or, or product. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, final thoughts. I know already sort of came into this, but if we now think about what is the one most important factor that influences the success of growth of companies. Sustainable growth, any kind of growth. This is what the companies currently say when we investigate. What is it? It's people. It's no coincidence that perhaps in Anus model, the scarce human capital is the, the, the most discussed uh, element. This is what will make the difference in, in the future, whether we make it or not. This also applies for Finland, for our future. It's the people who make the difference. In Finnish tech industry, we actually currently today need over 13,000 new people to enter the industry, to come and work. Uh, the total number of recruitments is over 50,000 per year. 
but this is the number of new people that we need. And, and it's actually uh, also the competence needs are changing very quickly. This is an example of what kinds of tasks are increasing. This is not all of the jobs. This is where you, you see the change. And this actually goes pretty well together if you think about the circular economy. It focuses on value to the customer. You need to create the solutions, and then you need the technologies to do that. And that's what's, what is showing also. This comes when we ask from the companies that what kind of tasks are currently increasing. It doesn't mean that everybody needs to be a data scientist, but perhaps you need to be able to work with the data scientists. But I still come back to this one, that the added value is the one that makes the difference, whether we are able to make the solutions. So I really hope all of you find your own paths and you will make the impact happen. That's best for all of our future. Thanks very much for joining.